We're pleased to bring Brother Dave to you this afternoon. He's got a very interesting title for his talk. It's called A Word to the Wise. Brother Dave. Thank you. Well, good afternoon to all three of you. We <laughs> but really, good afternoon, brethren. Good afternoon. When I first started to attend Bible student studies, my mother and I often talked about today's subject. She was very interested in these things and passed her love of the sub passed her love of the subject down to me. And this one's for you, Mom. Thank you. As we look back through the eyes of history, we start to perceive the absolute power of the papacy. Through the eyes of history, we see scientists being tortured and or killed for not holding to papacy's beliefs. These things tell us that Satan was and still is heavily involved in what is going on. The scientific community was hit hard by the papacy. Many scientists were forced to recant what they knew to be true, else they risked being burned at the stake or something equally as horrific. The papacy had total power to determine what was truth and what was not. It was a very dark time for mankind. Looking at the situation today, we realize that the papacy still has some power but nothing like it was. Scientists are not burned at the stake for teaching something other than what papacy teaches anymore. In fact, science today does not even consult religion about its beliefs. And one of his examples of this, while most Christian religions believe and teach that God created the earth and all that is in the heavens, the scientific community teaches just the opposite that God, even if he might exist, had no part in creating the earth and all the creatures that inhabit it. Centuries ago, scientists had to go before the papal leaders to get their approval on what the scientists had discovered and wrote about. If the papacy disapproved of the scientists' findings, he was told to recant and go back to teaching what was considered truth right or wrong. Papacy had total control over everything. And with that information, we can kind of understand why these days scientists want to keep out of the re religious arena. Can you blame them? What is interesting about this is that it was a win-win for Satan, who was the head of his masterpiece, papacy, and now has totally thrown out God's scriptures. And by doing that, has reversed the situation. Satan does not care if the papacy burns heretics on at the stake or if the scientific process shuts out biblical teachings. Either way, Satan is running the show. Not forever, thank you. Now, before I really get into this, I have a disclaimer. Much of what you are about to hear and see today comes from a booklet entitled some fishy stories about an unproved theory. It was written by Garner Ted Armstrong from Ambassador College and was first published and copyrighted <coughs> excuse me, in 1966. Most of the photographs are from the same book. Mr. Armstrong starts the book off by saying, quote, the biggest false doctrine today is evolution. Evolution is a faith, an almost religious belief in something not seen, not proved. There is some decidedly fishy, so something decidedly fishy, fishy well, let's try to get that word again, fishy about evolution, end quote. And I think that the Trinity might get some votes as well. And now, please understand that Satan is still around, and he certainly would love to have you in either fold, 
believers of evolution or believers in the Catholic Church and its ungodly doctrines. Now, I'm going to take a wild guess that the largest share of the brethren in this room do not believe in the theory of evolution espoused by so many in the scientific community today. You notice I say many. Not all scientists believe in evolution. However, the political climate in the scientific community, community assures that they do not speak up, or they may lose their jobs or worse. I also know that there are many Christian people that do believe in that theory. And there are some who prefer to compromise and believe that evolution is how God created the earth and all that is in it. Now, I personally believe that Satan is very happy when he hears that even some Christians believe in evolution. And I think he's ecstatic when he sees and hears the compromise theory. Anything to take us human beings away from God's truth. As Brother Russell says in the sixth volume, the two theories, evolution and creation, are squarely at issue. If, evolution, if the evolution theory be true, the Bible is false from Genesis to Revelation. If the Bible is true, as we hold, the evolution theory is utterly false in all its deductions as respects man, end quote. Well, I'm going to take a little bit different approach today. Maybe I have already. I don't know. Brother Russell suggested to us in reprint number 2559, quote, and the question form of suggesting truth will often be found the most forceful, end quote. I think then this might be helpful when talking to a staunch evolutionist. So I will be asking a lot of questions about evolution and the creation in this, and creation in this treatise. But before we continue, I think it is imperative to know what the battlefield is and who are the soldiers on this battlefield. We know who we are, but who is the enemy that teaches and preaches evolution as a sacred truth? How do we make him understand that God, along with his son, created everything? Well, the first thing that we need to realize is that the battle is not evolution versus creation. No, the battle is those who believe in an almighty, all-powerful, loving God against those who do not. You see, we can bring up all the scriptures that tell us that God created everything. Here's an example. Colossians 1:15 and 16 say about Jesus, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in the heavens and that are in the earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones, dominions, or principalities, or powers. All things were created by him and for him, end quote. This and other scriptures mean nothing to someone who does not believe in the existence of an almighty God. I mean, how could it? And I'm going to take you now to April 17th, 1966, to show you just what I mean when I refer to the battlefield. <clears throat> the following is a quote from a book entitled Some Fishy Stories. Quote, a blue ribbon meeting a blue ribbon meeting of scientists recently gathered for a two-day symposium in Philadelphia. By agreement at the beginning, there was no discussion of God or any form of a supreme being, end quote. An account of the meeting was given in the Philadelphia Bulletin, April 17, 1966. Quote, Some 35 of the world's most renowned scientists argued to the point that they shed coats and loosened ties. When they had finished, Darwin's theory had been badly battered. But the scientists failed to come up with a better one. End quote. I guess it never dawned on them that keeping God out of the meeting just might skew the outcome, which I think it most assuredly did. It might have just been a small peek behind the curtain of ignorance, a place that Satan calls home. 
and I'm quite sure that he was very interested in this meeting. That battle in 1966 was not a win necessarily for the evolutionists, but it was a huge blow to creationists. And I know, of course, that God had everything under control then and now, but the evolutionists did not know that, and they still don't. Continuing with the quote from A Fishy Story, the results of the meeting, they attacked Darwinism, showed him the theory of evolution as it presently stands is incomplete. But just what was missing? Well, they didn't say. But let the layman attack Darwinism, evolutionists would lift up hands of horror and disbelief, for one is not qualified to give an opinion, for one who has not agreed in advance to keep all ideas of a divine being out of the discussion to challenge evolutionary thought is not fair. It is not abiding by the tacit rules of scientific thinking." End quote. These are people who say that they are seeking truth. So, so we see so far that evolutionists are not interested in a discussion. They have made up their minds on the subject. Their conclusions, <clears throat> excuse me, their conclusions are correct and they have tossed God and faith out of the battle. And since quoting scripture will not prompt them to listen to God's truth, even for a second, then maybe we might think about <clears throat> changing our tactics. Mr. Armstrong has some more questions for us. On page two, he says, take a look at some of the marvelous creatures in this earthly environment of yours and ask yourself some logical, simple, rational, scientific questions about them. How can evolution be true? How did all these life forms develop? How did these creatures survive? How could all present life forms have gradually evolved from brown seaweed or from trees or from amoeba or from flatworms? And then Mr. Armstrong asks an unexpected question. Can we prove scientifically that God does exist? End quote. And I know we don't have to. We have faith in our Heavenly Father and His Bible. But you know, there are many Bible students and other Christians that send their children, <clears throat> excuse me, that send their children to colleges that teach evolution. This is why I'm suggesting another way of combating what is being fed to our children in school under the guise of scientific truth. That is the question we creationists must ask ourselves, and that puts us right back in the battle. To me, to me this is an exciting question. Can we prove scientifically that God does exist? Well, brethren, the gauntlet has been thrown down by the evolutionists, although probably unwittingly, maybe it is enough to persuade a tiny hand, handful that creation is truth and evolution is not. And there is a lot for us to learn by delving into these matters, my opinion. So let's take a look at some of God's marvelous creatures and see if they raise any pertinent questions and perhaps some answers. This is a clown anemone fish, or sometimes just clownfish. These fish are found in both the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. What makes them so special, so special is that they are not bothered by the lethal, lethal tentacles of the anemone. The tentacles of the anem anemone, I know I was gonna do that at least once, anemone have explosive stinging cells capable of killing, which leads to eating most fish coming in contact with them. But the clownfish is immune to the poisonous tentacles. So this is a perfect symbiotic relationship. The anemone is a protected resting place for clownfish because they are protected from all the other fish who would like to make a meal out of the clownfish. And the clownfish in turn brings food morsels to the anemone. And here are some comments from, again, some fishy stories. 
Evolution can't explain this surprising example of symbiosis. Two totally separate species living, to, living together for mutual benefit. Studies have shown that the various species of anemone fish have protective mucus coatings which prevent the anemone from discharging its lethal stinging cells. Both clownfish and anemone live quite well without the other. Yet, each does benefit from the other's help. According to an article in the book, they could never have evolved to this state of mutualism. Why? Because it is not necessary for their existence. End quote. I would like to introduce you to another marvelous fish, the archer fish. Now, I love this little guy. There are five species of archer fish. They are native to Indian and <clears throat> Southeast Asian waters, and they are also found in Northeastern Australia. So what makes this little fish, which averages about seven inches long, so special? Well, there's a lot to consider when we look very closely at this unique fish. The, the book calls this species nature's version of the Polaris submarine. You'll see what I mean as we continue. More quotes from some fishy stories. The retina of the archer's eye is much more complex than of most fish, having a large number of cones and rods. But even in this, the archer is still more complex. The cones number only eight or nine, since they are for the daytime vision. But there are 217 rods for night vision. It has been proved that the archer fish can extinguish a cigarette in total darkness with this powerful jet of water. This, of course, is how the fish got its moniker, Archer. And, of course, I would personally recommend this to anyone who wants to quit smoking. <laughs> but I'm bump. As the little fish develop, they begin spitting at numerous targets above the water in their natural habitat. At first, the tiny fish succeed in squirting their jet only two or three inches. Later, as adults, they will spurt a stream of water as far as 15 feet. Normally, the adult archer shoots down his prey at a range of only two or three, two to four feet, however, and the jet of water carries its flat trajectory only about 22 inches. It's time for another question. What makes this archer fish shoot down its prey? Ichthyologists have discovered a tiny groove in the roof of the archer's mouth. When the tongue, which is hard and bony, is compressed against the roof of the mouth, uh, roof of the mouth water is forced through the mouth by a sudden snapping shut of the gill covers. The water squirts out the gun barrel-like groove, usually striking its target the first time at a distance of up to two or three feet. Next question, please. Did squirting evolve? Today, the commonly accepted theory is that all life gradually but steadily evolved. If the archer fish gradually developed his remarkable Polaris ability, are we to assume he did so because it was necessary for his survival? That's a good question, don't you think? If that could possibly be true, then how did all the other fish who swim side by side with the archer and who always feed on the bottom, in the water, or at the surface, survive? Are we to assume that the archer fish was the only survivor? Or did multitudes of mutant genes pre-adapt the pre-archer to become an archer fish? Now think about the very first time a fish got the idea to squirt water to get food. How in the world did that idea come into his head? <clears throat> I mean, this is a fish after all. But the baffling part of this truth is that spouting water is not the archer fish's primary food getting method. The archer fish does not need to spout in order to get food. The archer fish still needs to feed on the surface and jumps clear of the surface to take insects on the wing 
or feeds on objects which sink a few inches into the water. One might theorize that one day long ago, a group of little archer fishes made their very first attempt at spitting, but they succeeded only in gurgling a few tiny drops above the surface. They had not yet developed the crucial parts of the process of spitting. They would have had also to be working on the groove in their tongue, slamming the gill plate shut and aiming the water spout, which is another problem. There is something called refraction involved in, it, in this as well. Refraction is the bending of light rays as they enter the water, causing the objects to appear where they are not. But the archer fish solves the problem each time with remarkable accuracy. Tests have shown that the little fellow even pinpoints his, spouse, his spout with such care that he blasts insects away from perches. <clears throat> uh, away from perches to which they would cling. For instance, when an insect is crouching on the side of a tank, the fish would aim the jet of water directly beneath the insect, thus dislodging it from the glass rather than hitting it on the back and only succeeding in getting it wet. The archer also solves the problem of refraction by swimming to directly below the insect, thereby reducing the refraction to nothing or almost nothing. The archer fish, as intelligent as it seems, however, can easily be tricked into shooting at non-edible objects. The book says this about that situation, quote, here is the paradox for evolution. Intelligent behavior in a fish that doesn't exhibit the ability to learn. Well, there's only one explanation for this. A highly intelligent being had to infuse that fish with the intelligence that it has. So, does God exist? Well, it's starting to look like it, isn't it? Thank you, Garner Ted, for putting this section into layman's terms. John Rennie, in the Scientific American publication, tries to help us understand the evolution of the eye. Quote, generations of creationists have tried to counter Darwin by citing the example of the eye as a, stru a structure that could not have evolved. The eye's ability to provide vision depends on the perfect arrangement of its parts, these critics say. Natural selection could thus never favor the transitional forms needed during the eye's evolution. I mean, what good is half an eye? Anticipating this criticism, Darwin suggested that even in complete eyes might confer benefits such as helping creatures orient toward light and thereby survive for future for further evolutionary refinement biology has been vindic has vindicated darwin researchers have identified primitive eyes and light sensing organs throughout the animal kingdom and have even tracked the evolutionary history of eyes through comparative genetics. It now appears that in various families of organisms, eyes have evolved independently. Author John Rennie again published online in the Scientific American July 1st, 2002. And I found this fascinating. The writer says, Darwin suggested incomplete eyes have evolved independently. So the writer says Darwin suggest, uh, suggested incomplete eyes might confer benefits. And it now appears that dot, dot, dot. And now I have a question. Evolutionary refinement, question mark. Who or what is doing this refining? But I guess if Darwin put it into words, it must be correct, 
It's kind of the feeling I get. Darwin, anticipating this criticism, suggested that even incomplete eyes might confer benefits, cleverly bypassing the obvious question, which is, how did any fish see to eat and not get eaten by predators before they had eyes at all? Incomplete eyes? I don't think so. And when in the process did the brain start hooking up with these incomplete eyes? Did the brain evolve first? The eye, or you know, later the eyes? How did both the independent partial eyes manage to hook up the incomplete brain and operate in perfect tandem? Well, here are some quotes given to us by evolutionary scientist Julian Huxley. Quote, How can a blind and automatic sifting process like selection, operating on a blind and undirected process like mutation, produce organs like the, like the eye, or the brain with their own incredible complexity and delicacy of adjustment? How can chance produce eloquent, eloquent design? In a word, are you not asking us to believe too much? Oh, the answer is no. All this is not too much to believe once one has grasped the way the process operates. But now comes the incredible impossibility of any such thing occurring. Julian Huxley, a renowned British evolutionary biologist, continues showing the odds against a higher animal evolving. Quote, A little calculation demonstrates how incredibly improbable the results of natural selection can be when enough time is available. And he continues, a portion of favorable mutations of one in a thousand does not sound like much, but is probably generous since so many mutations are lethal, preventing the organism living at all, and the great majority of the rest throw the machinery slightly out of gear and a total of one million mutational steps sounds like a great deal, but is probably an underestimate. After all, that only means one step every 2,000 years during a biological time as a whole. However, let us take these figures as being reasonable estimates. With this proportion, but without any selection, we should clearly, clearly have to breed a thousand strains to get one favorable mutation, a million strains, a thousand squared, to get the one containing two favorable mutations, and on up to a thousand to the millionth power to get one containing a million. Huxley continues, of course, this could not really happen, but it is a useful way of visualizing the fantastic odds against getting a number of favorable mutations in one strain through pure chance alone. A thousand to the millionth power, when written out, <clears throat> becomes the figure one with three million zeros after it. And that would take three large volumes of about 500 pages each just to print. No one would bet on anything so improbable happening. Are you ready? And yet it has happened. Thanks to the workings of natural selection and the properties of living substance, which make natural selection inevitable. End quote. From Evolution in Action, Julian Huxley. Any mind which is really rational, really thinking, and really open knows this is a hoax, an utter impossibility. Let us turn our minds now to another little fish who his friends call four eyes. No, he doesn't wear glasses. He actually has four eyes. And this is an anableps. Notice he... 
Notice clearly the bifocal eye system of this fish, one for above water and the other for below water viewing. To imagine one complex eye evolving is ridiculous, but to propound the idea that two different eye systems evolved on the same fish is intellectual insanity. End quote. The anableps spends most of his time sw swimming along the surface of the water with two of his eyes above the surface and two below. To, um, the anableps is designed so each set of eyes can see under entirely different conditions. Not only does the anableps have two separate corneas, but even separate retinas in the backs of his eyes. Any object seen out of the water is viewed through his special air viewing eyes, flattened, much like a human eye lens, and transmitted to his lower retina. But objects he sees under the water are viewed through the under cornea and brought into focus on the upper retina. The eyes of the anableps are comparable to modern bifocal spectacles, divided into an upper and lower portion. Each is adapted for a different sort of vision. Here's another question from the book. Would anyone claim that bifocals evolved? I thought that was a good question. Here are some more thoughts from the book, some fishy stories. Well, let's go back in history, millions and millions of years, perhaps billions, since evolutionists seem to assume that given enough time, practically anything could happen. Here's our first little school of would-be anableps, only they're not anableps because they don't have the four eyes yet. But which two? They're underwater eyes or they're above water eyes? And we make the assumption that they had one or the other. They are doing just fine, obtaining Food, their food, just like any other fish, swimming along in the water, looking up through the, through the eyes, their fish eyes, feeding at the surface, but they can't spot ospreys or fish hawks and so forth. Since they are right at the surface, they are easy prey for a whole host of predators. No would-be anableps survive. All are eaten. The writer continues, well, why reason this way? Simple. If the pre anableps were forced by natural selection to develop their extra set of eyes, which would have taken admittedly an innumerable number of years, in order to survive, then they could not have survived without them. And if they didn't survive then, they don't exist. But if they needed to develop two other eyes to survive, weren't they kind of taking the long way around? Why stay at the surface when they are so vulnerable to fish from below and to predators from above? Why not swim down for the mud on the bottom and hide in the caverns under the rocks like any self-respecting frightened fish would do? Why not begin feeding down deeper in the water? End quote. But let's assume that somehow one school of little would-be anableps who weren't really complete completely developed anableps yet, finally, after hundreds of thousands of years, acquired an extra set of eyes through mutation, reproduction, and natural selection. Fine, they have eyes, but their tiny little nervous system hasn't kept pace. The results in, this results in paralysis and all kinds of bad stuff. We learned from author John Rennie earlier, quote, it now appears that in various families of organisms, eyes have evolved independently, end quote. I am wondering, if eyes have evolved independently, how do they know how and when to hook up with the brain? As, so, as I see it then, anableps is evolving for bazillions of years, and the body of the anableps houses all its organs and bodily functions except for the four eyes, which are evidently on another totally dissimilar learning growth pattern. I think someday they will just all kind of get together, I guess. I don't know. 
All I know is it sounds a little fishy to me. When I was much younger, I used to love to go fishing. You can imagine my astonishment when I found out that some fish go fishing as well. Yes, fish, fish. There are actually 225 different species of fish that fish. Oddly enough, these predators are called anglerfish. This picture was taken at the Ambassador College Photo Research Laboratory, and you can readily see that there is something attached to the front of the face of this anglerfish. This is the anglerfish's fishing pole. That's right. This is what the anglerfish uses to catch his fish. It basically works this way. A small fish spots the lure, which he assumes is something to eat, and when he gets close enough, the anglerfish, boom, just scarfs the little fish down, gone in a heartbeat. More from this author, from the book. Evolution seeks to explain how all life forms, in their myriad complexity, their fantastic balance and interdependency, their beauty or ugliness, evolved. How gradually, through resident forces and by natural causes, certain constructive changes took place. The greatest excuse of evolution is always time. Given enough time, they reason, almost anything can happen. But billions upon billions more eons than ever, even revolu <laughs> evolutionists claim, evolution could never make a bird's feather out of a loosely hanging frayed scale. And it cannot give its own rules, principles, and explain a ludicrous fishing pole hanging out of a fish's head, end quote. And here's an aside. When I was a freshman in college, my zoology professor said this exact same thing about the frayed reptile scale evolving into a feather. I thought to myself, this is crazy talk. This guy just made this up on the spot. However, here is a quote from the book entitled, A Theory for the Birds, which is quoting the book, The Birds, Natural Life Natural Library. Quote, how did this structural marvel, feathered wings, evolve? Well, it takes no great stretch of the imagination to envisage a feather as a modified scale, basically like that of a reptile, a longish scale loosely attached whose outer edges frayed and spread out until it evolved into the highly complex structure that it is today, end quote. No great stretch of the imagination? That's stretching it clear beyond a breaking point. Back to the angler fish, and resume quote. But here's the problem. Angler fish are terrible swimmers. Actually, they prefer to sidle or walk along the rocks by means of their ugly, elbowed pectoral fins rather than swim. As such, they have a terrible problem catching some other fish. They slowly paddle about or crawl. But they, did they develop that way? From what original state? Did they formally swim about on the surface, at medium depths, on the bottom? If an anglerfish evolved, he evolved from some original state, a pre-angler of some time, of some kind. <clears throat> but let's think about this a little further. Let's imagine in our mind's eye the very first would-be anglerfish. He didn't angle because he didn't yet have a bony membrane with a fleshy worm dangling from the end of it, growing right out from between his eyes. Whether evolutionists would insist he was slow, ungainly, bulky, or whether slim, sleek, and fast, he most certainly was not yet, according to evolution, an angler, end quote. Well, I say, let's get into some fishing stories. Here are just a few for time's sake. Here we see Freddy the frustrated fisherman fish, a would-be angler. He's ugly. Let's create then our would-be angler. Back, back in time, billions upon billions of uncounted aeons ago, 
some bizarre series of accidental mutations occurred whereby some sleek, fast, well-designed fish produced an ugly, huge-headed, elbow-fin, slow-moving fish that looked about as much like a rock or a clump of moss as he did a fish. Unfamiliar with the bottom of the sea, remember he had been a sleek, fast, darting type, easily, uh, easily able to eat small fish until this horrible transformation began to take place. He lunges first at this passing fish and then another. Freddy can do nothing but stir up the sand and moss. Desperate to survive, Freddy must think of something quick. Ah, a fishing pole. That would be just the thing. You're too early, brother. I'll talk faster. <clears throat> Through trial and error of evolution, anglers have selected a variety of uh, uh, exotic lures from nature's tackle box. The Living World of the Sea by William Cromie, as quoted in the book, Some Fishy Stories, quote, Freddy swims or walks over to nature's tackle box, which, whatever that is, he studies all the equipment, selects the lure, and looks around for a rod to hang it on. But then there are another problem arises. No males of the species angle, only the females. There's another important fact. Not only do anglers have the instinct to attract other fish to their little fleshy baits, they have the automatic instinct not to grab it themselves. And here is what might be a conundrum for the evolutionists. Since female fish, since the females fish and eat their catch immediately, how do the males get nourishment? Do the females spit out half the fish? Do they feed the male by regurgitation like some birds feeding their young? No. As it turns out, the males literally hook onto the females and the two blood streams unite. The male is fed intravenously. Can you picture this? Here's a frustrated male trying to hook up to the blood supply of a busily fishing female. I can't imagine how many males died until they figured out how to do this. Just how both sexes evolved simultaneously and then began immediately to reproduce after their own kind is an unsurmountable impossibility for evolution to explain. End quote. My point? There are many colleges and high schools in our country that teach evolution as truth. Your child or your grandchild may have to make a choice someday. I'm thinking of two things as they learn about what's ahead of them. Know the facts. Trust our Heavenly Father. What I was hoping for in this discourse was to convince laymen like me that you can use logic, common sense, and your faith to help your children make wise choices. May the Lord watch over our children and help us, to, help us to guide them through these complex issues in this troublous time. May his name be praised by what we say and the spirit in which we say it. And as an example of what our children are up against, here is the mission statement of Baylor University. Quote, the mission of Baylor University is to educate men and women for worldwide leadership and service by integrating academic excellence and Christian commitment within a caring community, end quote. And here is their statement about evolution. Quote, evolution, a foundational principle of modern biology, is supported by overwhelming scientific evidence and is accepted by the vast majority of scientists. Because it is fundamental to the understanding of modern biology, the faculty in the biology department at Baylor University, Waco, Texas, teach evolution throughout the biology curriculum. We are in accordance with the American Association for Advancement of Sciences Statement on Evolution. We are a science department, so we do not teach alternate hypotheses or philosophically deduced theories that cannot be tested these are also known as creation. May the Lord add his blessing.